Hey guys, hope everyone is doing well. Um, Had a whole bunch of updates coming out of Israel and Gaza that just felt like couldn't wait. Um, So I wanted to break down a number of things for you, including a message from the Pope over this holiday season, a viral message from a uh, Palestinian reverend in Bethlehem. We also have new evidence emerging, including videos of potential war crimes. Uh, We have a new report from the Washington Post comparing this level of destruction in Gaza to all other wars this century and finding that already in just this comparatively short period of time, this surpasses the brutality and destruction of anything that we have seen this century. They've got maps and data to prove that. So I'll show you that as well. We've also got uh, some new data coming out of Israel about just what Israeli Jews want to see in the quote unquote day after. Spoiler alert, it's ethnic cleansing. And clearly this is also what their political leaders are pushing for as well. And lastly, we've got um, this is a huge development. Israel allegedly assassinating one of Iran's top generals. Dr. Teresa Parsi had a really important thread breaking down what this could mean, what Israel could be pushing for here. And of course, this, you know, sparking concerns, additional concerns of a potential regional war, which would certainly directly pull in the United States of America. But I wanted to start with a a viral Christmas message uh, from a, a reverend in Bethlehem sharing his thoughts on what is happening. This is uh, Palestinian Reverend Munther Isaac preaching in Bethlehem on December 23rd. Let's go ahead and take a listen to what he had to say. Gaza today has become the moral compass of the world. Gaza was hell before October 7th, and the world was silent. Should we be surprised that there's silence now? If you are not appalled, by what is happening in Gaza. If you are not shaken to your core, there is something wrong with your humanity. And if we as Christians are not outraged by the genocide, by the weaponization of the Bible to justify it, there is something wrong with our Christian witness and we are compromising the credibility of our gospel message. If you fail to call this a genocide, it is on you. It is a sin and a darkness you willingly embrace. Some have not even called for a ceasefire. I'm talking about churches. I feel sorry for you. We will be okay. Despite the immense blow we have endured, we the Palestinians will recover. We will rise. We will stand up again from the midst of destruction as we have always done as Palestinians. Although this is by far maybe the biggest blow we have received in a long time, but we will be okay. Very powerful words there. And I intentionally began with that, not only because of the season, uh, appropriate message for the season, I suppose, but also because it helps put in context everything else we're going to talk about today, because I do think there will be a time not long from now when everyone looks back and is horrified by the atrocities that have been committed here on a daily basis with the not only um, acceptance, but the uh, United States, the most powerful country in the world, aiding and abetting these crimes, shipping weapons, providing diplomatic cover, providing rhetorical cover, you know, doing this, playing this game of pretending like uh, Joe Biden and co are really concerned about civilian lives, which is, uh, you know, at this point, just a ruse to try to buy Israel even more time to commit the atrocities that they've been committing. And uh, I also wanted to share with you uh, the Pope with uh, some some similar language, I would say, calling out the horrors of this war. And he has been very outspoken uh, throughout this war, including calling some of Israelis' actions terrorism and uh, certainly calling for an end and a ceasefire, an end to the bloodshed. This is per Reuters, as posted in Haaretz. Pope laments war in Holy Land on solemn Christmas Eve. Pope Francis lamented war in the land of the birth of Jesus on Sunday, where Christmas Eve brought only fresh bloodshed and an intensification of fighting across the length of the Gaza Strip. Tonight, he said, our hearts are in Bethlehem, where the Prince of Peace is once more rejected by the futile logic of war, by the clash of arms that even today prevents him from finding room in the world. 
Palestinian Christians, they say, earlier held a Christmas vigil in Bethlehem with candlelit hymns and prayers for peace in Gaza instead of the usual celebrations. There was no large tree, the usual centerpiece of Bethlehem's Christmas celebrations. Nativity figurines in churches were placed amid rubble and barbed wire in solidarity with the people of Gaza. And as I had mentioned before, um, you know, the Pope's most recent comments, as far as I'm aware, before this had been with regard to the um, IDF killing of two Christian women, a mother and daughter, who were sheltering at a um, historic Christian church in Gaza. They were walking, uh, I believe, to use the bathroom at the convent, and an IDF sniper took them out. And those were the actions that the the Pope referred to as terrorism. So he continues to um, speak in grave terms about what we are witnessing here. And there's a good reason for that. It appears that we may have just seen the most deadly stretch of killing yet since um, October 7th, since Israel began their assault on Gaza. This is per Al Jazeera. Israel intensifies Gaza strikes, killing 250 Palestinians in 24 hours. More than 100 people have been killed in an Israeli strike on the Magazi refugee camp with families still trapped in rubble. Uh, let me read you a little bit of this. They spoke to, uh, or they, they are recording the comments of, of a woman, a bereft woman on Monday at that refugee camp saying, my entire family is gone. All five of my brothers are gone. They didn't leave me any brothers, all of them. Palestinians lined up to touch the shrouded bodies of those killed in Israeli strikes on the camp in a funeral on Monday, commemorating dozens of people who were killed, many of them women and children. An Al Jazeera reporter in Gaza said the figure has now reached more than 100. The government media office in Gaza said fa seven families were wiped out completely in that Israeli attack on a residential square in the camp. One of those residents, Zayad Awad, told Al Jazeera, the Israeli army doesn't spare civilians. My child said to me, help me, what's happening? I can't breathe. And of course, we're all very well aware of the unbelievable toll uh, in terms of civilian deaths, in terms of women, in terms of children. Uh, that's another way in which this conflict stands out from all others. And, you know, when you when you cover this, when you care about this, you always get these questions of, like, oh, why are you so focused on this? There are lots of terrible things happening in the world. And that's true. Lots of terrible things happening in the world. But even with that being said, on the level of starvation, on the level which I'm about to show you, of the uh, destruction of buildings, just total, you know, turning the whole landscape into a moonscape or a parking lot, destroying all kinds of civilian infrastructure. This is the worst this century, and certainly in terms of the number of children killed, which is significantly over 10,000 kids killed at this point. You know, this is like nothing else that we have seen in recent history. And then you add to that as an American citizen the fact that, you know, when you're sending in your taxes here in, in the new year, they are going for some of these 2,000 pound bunker busting bombs that have been indiscriminately dropped all over Gaza. And uh, there was a report, I don't have the element here for you, but you know, another um, many tons of weapons and ammo just being shipped by Biden to Israel. So all of their you know, supposed concerns about civilian life and oh, we've been having these tough conversations. Total and utter nonsense. Total and utter nonsense. So. Let me show you, and this is um, this is very disturbing, but I, I think it's important if you're able to bear it to see some of um, the video that is emerging. We talked before about reports of uh, summary executions. We also talked previously on breaking points about uh, how they were rounding up civilians, civilian men, stripping them naked, posting pictures of um, their you know utter humiliation. Even Israel admitted after those uh, roundups that most the overwhelming number of those who had been, um, you know, rounded up, stripped naked and humiliated in this way, that they were civilians. So um, we have another video that has emerged here that I want to share with you. Let me go ahead and uh, and pull this up. And uh, this the sound is not important on this one, so I'll keep it low, but take a listen to this. So you can see here um, these, in some instances, children i mean if you look closely at these pictures you see men and you see little boys 
who have been rounded up, hands on their head. They're using a um, an empty uh, soccer field or football field to uh, conduct these, you know, mass detentions. Uh, this is from Rami Abdul with uh, uh, Euromed Monitor, and they have a report about alleging uh, these war crimes and documenting some of the summary executions. What he writes here is, Field executions and mass detentions, alarming footage of Israeli forces turning a stadium in Gaza into a mass detention camp. The video shows the detention of hundreds of civilians, including women, elders, and babies. Euromed Monitor has confirmed that the Israeli forces are carrying out field executions against civilians in Gaza after forcibly removing them from displacement centers and stripping them. So that is what you are watching in this horrifying video. And they have, as I said, um, they have pulled together a report that they have uh, submitted to uh, UN rapporteurs and the ICC prosecutor. This is a primary report documenting dozens of field execution cases in Gaza. I'll read a little bit of this to you in a primary report submitted to UN special rapporteurs and the prosecutor of the ICC. Euromed Human Rights Monitor has documented dozens of cases of field executions carried out by the Israeli army in the Gaza Strip. The human rights group requested an immediate investigation into these crimes, calling for the perpetrators to be held accountable and for justice for all victims. Um, if you read through this, they have documented multiple instances of what they describe as crimes and liquidations. Um, you can see the dates here and some of the details that they have submitted with uh, evidence in order to uh, you know, start an investigation, hopefully, and uh, some accountability, hopefully. Wouldn't hold my breath on any of this because the truth of the matter is, I think, after what we're seeing unfolding here, with the active participation of the United States and uh, with you know us providing diplomatic cover, et cetera, like any idea that human rights, war crimes, that any of this matters, I just don't know how you sustain it. And we are truly back to you know pre-World War II period. And that comes out in Netanyahu's rhetoric, of course, where he says, oh, well, you know, we're not doing anything different than what uh, the allies did and what you all did in terms of World War II. And anytime anyone says that, remember, first of all, there is actual data to show that the level of destruction in Gaza now surpasses what we did in places like Dresden that were synonymous with mass civilian casualties and um, destruction of civilian infrastructure. But second of all, there's a reason why after World War II, we put in place things like the Geneva Conventions so that civilians would face some level of protection and so that we wouldn't have um, the horrors unfolding again that we saw in wars like World War II. So, uh, but all of that completely, completely out the window. So let's talk about this, you know, fake conversation about what is going to happen on the day after. Of course, U.S. officials, oh, we, we want the Palestinian Authority to come in and then we want a two-state solution, completely ignoring that, Netanyahu is adamantly opposed to that, has been clear that he's adamantly opposed to that, has been bragging about how he is the reason why there is no Palestinian state, has been bragging that he is the guy to continue to prevent such a state uh, from taking hold. And now we have just the latest indication of many reports that, you know, we've tried to bring you that uh, he knows what he wants on the day after, and it is ethnic cleansing. He said in a uh, Likud meeting today, according to a, a Hebrew Israeli outlet, that he is actively working to ethnic transfer Palestinians out of Gaza. And as this person uh, rightly indicates, similar statements have been made by other ministers, but none of them had direct involvement in war policy. Now we've got it coming straight from Netanyahu, and it should be seen as a statement of intent. And uh, I saw others saying that, hey, listen, you know, we should be asking every U.S. politician and every media figure at this point, every analyst, what they think about this potential, you know, ethnic cleansing of Gaza. We know Bibi Netanyahu has talked about uh, he's he's pushing his senior aide to come up with plans to, quote, thin out the Gaza Strip. We're seeing all of this incredibly dystopian language of framing this in humanitarian uh, terms. And the the game here is very clear render all of Gaza uninhabitable, which frankly has been a project years in the making and is just vastly accelerated by this current assault. 
Northern Gaza is already uninhabitable, unlivable. Seawater being pumped into tunnels, which is rendering the aquifer uh, unusable, further compromising. It was already uh, the case that the overwhelming majority of Gazans had no access to clean water even before this. Um, you know, destroy all of the civilian infrastructure. That was the game with Al Shifa, uh, which was, you know, a beating heart of G- Gaza civilian life. So, you know, destroying all of that, making it so no one can come back and then saying, oh, the humanitarian thing to do is to relocate people. We know that there was a, a plan that apparently has some bipartisan support to use U.S. aid dollars to pressure regional countries, including Egypt and others, to accept hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees and make no mistake about it. This is the direction that Israel is going to push in. And, you know, the longer that this goes on, the more of Gaza that is rendered completely uninhabitable, the more likely they are to succeed. And using this, you know, just the ultimate gaslighting of language, claiming that it is humanitarian to engage in this uh, final ethnic cleansing of Gaza. And by the way, there's also a reason why Netanyahu, outside of his ideological commit to, commitment to this outcome over a long period of time. But guess what? He's also fighting for his life, and this is the outcome that is extremely popular among Jewish Israelis. 83% of Israelis, according Jewish Israelis, we should say, according to this new poll, support the expulsion of Gaza's population under the label, quote-unquote, voluntary migration. That's, again, the, you know... Um, gaslighting Orwellian term that they're using for this voluntary this person opines as in leave Gaza or die by starvation airstrikes diseases bullets or under an IDF bulldozer well said 68 percent you can see this uh this poll that was shared it's uh the words are in in Hebrew obviously 68 percent are extremely supportive of this genocidal proposal and 15 percent I presume are moderately supportive you add those together you get the 83 percent who say yes yay ethnic cleansing so that's what we're looking at here um at the same time we have uh some dramatic developments in terms of um israeli actions possibly sparking a wider war let me put this up on the screen for you this is incredible so a top iranian commander assassinated in a reported israeli airstrike Iran warned Israel will pay for the killing of Syed Razi Mousavi, senior military advisor known as a close companion to the assassinated General Qasem Soleimani, senior advisor in Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, killed in Israeli airstrike outside the Syrian capital of Damascus on Monday. That's according to Iranian state media, three security sources later confirmed Syed Razi Mousavi's death. Two Reuters, Iran state television, interrupted its regularly scheduled program to announce Mousavi had been killed. The wire reported it was described in a Revolutionary Guard statement read on the air as a brigadier general and one of the guard's most important figures in Syria responsible for coordinating its military alliance with Iran. He was also described as a close companion to Qasem Soleimani, the top Iranian general who led the guard's elite Quds force until he was killed in a U.S. airstrike in Iraq in January 2020. Undoubtedly, the usurper and savage Zionist regime will pay for this crime, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi said in Monday's televised statement. According to Iran's Tasnim news agency, this action is another sign of frustration, helplessness, and inability of the occupying Zionist regime. No immediate comment from the IDF, but it is widely expected. <clears throat> and understood that Israel was probably behind this assassination. Israel, they say, was bracing for a response by Iran on its northern front, the Jerusalem Post reported later on Monday, citing local media reports. I will also add to that there were some comments from um, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant saying, we are fighting a war on seven fronts, seven fronts, and we have taken action on six of those. So this could be one of the uh, fronts that they're referring to there in which they've taken action. We also have the U.S. separately, you know, uh, ramping up attacks on these Houthi-related um, suicide drones. I think they, we shut down a dozen of them. That comes as they've been um, essentially blocking shipping through the Red Sea, This uh, and it's taking a huge toll, especially on the Israeli economy, also partly on the global economy. And the U.S. has marshaled this new coalition of the willing to uh to try to restore the ability to um traverse that shipping lane wanted to to read for you 
what uh, Dr. Parsi had to say about this uh, Israeli assassination alleged of it, that top Iranian general, because I think he lays out what they could be up to here, what the intent could be, and also what it could mean going forward. So if you bear with me, I'm going to read through this. He says some brief analysis and, and that this assassination was presumably by Israel. Bottom line, Israel either killed Mosavi as a warning to Iran, given Tehran's support for the Houthis' targeting of ships in the Red Sea, as a provocation to beget an Iranian response that would give Israel a pretext to enlarge the war, or as a preparatory move to enlarge the war regardless of Iran's response. He goes on, it's very likely Israel's behind the assassination of Mosavi since it is the only power with both a motive and capacity to pull off such a killing, not to mention a long history of assassinating Iranian operatives. The U.S. has the capacity but not necessarily the motive. The analysis below rests on the rather safe assumption that Mosavi was assassinated by Israel. U.S. intelligence believes that Iran has been actively involved in the Houthi movement's targeting of ships in the Red Sea, which has effectively closed the Bab el-Mandab straight for Israel and cost the Israeli economy billions of dollars. The Houthis insist they will continue the attacks despite threats of retaliation from the U.S. until Israel ceases its bombardment of Gaza. Israel, of course, refuses. Biden is loath to press Israel for a ceasefire. From Israel Israel's perspective, Iran is not paying a price for its alleged role in the Red Sea attacks. The assassination may, as a result, be a warning to Iran that Israel has the capacity and willingness to exact a price from Iran, even in areas where the Iranians may have presumed they are safe. So that's scenario number one. In a second scenario, the assassination may be a deliberate provocation to beget an Iranian response that would give Israel the pretext to enlarge the war. So in this second scenario that he envisions here, this is an attempt to intentionally draw Iran into this war, sparking a wider regional war. He says, while the Biden administration has given Israel a complete green light to bomb Gaza to smithers, Biden opposes an expansion of the war since that could likely drag the U.S. into it. The debate inside the Israeli government is increasingly leaning toward expanding the war. They've already mobilized 300,000 plus troops. There is growing belief in Israel. It simply is intolerable for Israel to live next to Hezbollah. They thought they could manage the threat from Hamas, and they couldn't, even though it was not Hezbollah that attacked Israel on October 7th. The Israeli argument is that next time it might be Hezbollah, and as a result, Israel has no choice but to expand the war. But unless there is an attack from Iran or Hezbollah itself, the U.S. may continue to oppose such a move. And we have seen is. Israelis, um, the Israeli government floating this sort of trial balloon of, oh, Hezbollah is violating this particular UN resolution as if they care about any other UN resolution, only when it's convenient for them, and trying to shop that around as like a pretext for potentially more directly attacking Hezbollah itself. Of course, there have already been skirmishes in that region already. He goes on, the assassination of Mousavi may cause Iran to retaliate against Israel via Hezbollah, the reasoning goes, and Israel can then use Hezbollah's action as a pretext to not only expand the war to Lebanon, but also for Force the U.S. to go along with it. Lastly, he said there's a third explanation. According to Amwash Media, Mousavi was in charge of facilitating the entry of Iran-led forces and arms shipments to Syria, as well as Lebanon's Hezbollah movement. If Israel intends to attack Lebanon, taking out Mousavi could be a logical first step to disrupt the arming of Hezbollah as well as its, its supply lines. As such, the assassination may be a preparatory move to enlarge the war regardless of Iran's response to the killing of Mousavi. So in the second scenario, it's the intent is to trigger some sort of retaliatory response and, and launch a broader war. Here, it's to enlarge the war regardless of whether Iran responds in a provocative manner. All of these scenarios, he says, point to one undeniable reality. As long as Biden refuses to pressure Israel to accept a ceasefire in Gaza, tensions in the region will continue to rise. And the Middle East will gravitate towards a regional war that very likely will engulf the U.S. as well. Biden may think he can control these events that allow Israel to slaughter the people in Gaza while keeping a lid on the escalation risk. He is likely wrong. And the American people may soon find themselves in yet another unnecessary war in the Middle East because of Biden's strategic incompetence. And I think that lays it out incredibly well, the dangers that we are facing and the potential risk of this broader war and also lays out the very real possibility that Israel is actively courting this broader war. And as I said previously, you know, we already had them sort of workshopping this and trial ballooning this with regard to a w wider war. There have even been comments coming out from top officials, perhaps even including Netanyahu, if memory serves, 
saying that after the war with Hamas is finished, then they want to move on to the uh, war with Hezbollah. Now, of course, the reality is this hasn't been a war with Hamas. It's been a war against the civilian population in Gaza. It's been a war intended to provoke a, quote, shock among the civilian population in Gaza. It's been a war on the civilian infrastructure in Gaza. I'm about to show you that as well. Um, And it has been a war with the ultimate intent of complete ethnic cleansing of Gaza. There were comments made previously, I don't know if you guys recall this, I'm pretty sure we covered it on the show, saying, hey, we could turn uh, Beirut into Gaza. We could do the same things in Lebanon that we're doing in Gaza. So if that isn't a threat against civilians, I don't know what is. And we also have those uh, reports from multiple human rights organizations and confirmed by the Washington Post of white phosphorus already having been dropped on civilians in Lebanon, in southern southern Lebanon, um, in contravention of the rules of war. So a um, lot to be very, very concerned about there. Lastly, just to put things in perspective and kind of uh, tie things together with where we started about the big picture, what we are all witnessing unfolding before our eyes here, oh no, I'm paywalled, is the utter destruction, the utter destruction that is unlike anything that we have seen um, this century. So they compared, the Washington Post compared in this report that I'm paywalled from, sorry guys, um, they confirmed that they looked at the satellite data and the number of buildings that had been destroyed and damaged. They compared it to Raqqa, they compared it to Aleppo, they compared it to Mosul. These are considered the three most devastated cities um, in bombings that have occurred in this century. And they found that in just seven weeks time, because this data is a little old, so this doesn't even take into account recent bombings. In seven weeks time, this assault on Gaza has been more devastating, just in sheer numbers of buildings destroyed, damaged than any of those conflicts. It should come as no surprise when you consider uh, the fact that, you know, you have this AI driven, what's being called mass assassination factory, doesn't come as a surprise when, you know, 972 Magazine is reporting about these quote unquote power targets that Israel is intentionally going after to create that shock in the civilian population. Power targets are things like high-rise apartment buildings. They're things like hospitals, other public civilian infrastructure. Gaza City, of course, basically leveled now. I mean, just utterly destroyed, completely uninhabitable. And also when you consider things like um, previous reports, we've talked about the number of 2,000 pound bombs that have been dropped here. The fact that half, more than half of the bombs have been quote unquote dumb bombs, not targeted. And when we were fighting in Mosul, which was, you know, incredibly devastating to uh, civilian life and civilian infrastructure, certainly our military, which has hardly been a paragon of perfect moral war fighting, determined that 500 pound bombs were the absolute max that you should be dropping in this sort of dense urban environment. And in Gaza, routinely, Israel is dropping 2,000 pound bombs that we, the United States of America, continue to provide them in spite of all of our, oh, the civilians, oh, bomb a little nicer, oh, maybe wrap things up in the new year at some point. Bullshit. Bullshit. All of that should be seen as attempting to buy some cover to enable Israel to continue this bombing longer, longer, when already, again, in just the first seven weeks, more destructive than any other war this century. So that's where we are, guys. Um, Appreciate you as always. You know, obviously, this news is incredibly dark. Um, I do want to say, because I was thinking a lot about this over um, Christmas and the holiday myself. We are seeing the worst, the absolute worst of humanity, seeing things that, you know, I hoped had been consigned to pages of history books. Clearly, they hadn't been. But I also think about, you know, that um, I think about the Pope speaking about, I think about that uh, reverend that I played in the beginning, his comments. um, And I really think about the courage of, you know, the doctors and nurses in these hospitals in Gaza working in 
the most unimaginable circumstances, sacrificing their own lives, putting their, their family's lives at risk to try to care for people as best they possibly can. I mean, I literally can't, I can't imagine being a doctor or nurse in a normal situation, let alone a war zone, let alone the most destructive war zone in this entire century. Just absolute heroes. I think about the journalists, more than 100 of whom have been killed, many of them intentionally targeted for assassination and their family members as well. The risk that they are taking to show the world what is happening here, just absolute heroism. And I think about just the ordinary people trying to survive, just trying to keep it together and get day to day and find a little bit of food so their kids don't starve to death. I mean, over half a million people now starving in Gaza. There's a lot of human bravery, human heroism um, here as well. So in any case, um, love you guys. I hope you are enjoying uh, some lovely holiday time that you are safe and, and enjoying some blessings of the season. Uh, with your family and with your loved ones. And uh, I'll make sure to keep you guys updated if anything else needs to be brought to you. Take care.